you're taking notes, I want you to write down the title of this message. There is no God. Some of you are like, honey, I think we went to the wrong church today. <laughs> Cap, Cap has lost his mind. Let's read. Psalm 53. Only fools say in their hearts, there is no God. They are corrupt and their actions are evil. Not one of them does good. God looks down from heaven on the entire human race. He looks to see if anyone is truly wise, if anyone seeks God. But no, all have turned away. All have become corrupt. No one does good. Not a single one. Will those who do evil never learn? They eat up my people like bread and wouldn't think of praying to God. Terror will grip them. Terror like they have never known before. God will scatter the bones of your enemies. You will put them to shame for God has rejected them. Who will come from Mount Zion to rescue Israel? When God restores his people, Jacob will shout with joy and Israel will rejoice. That's heavy. <laughs> Are you kidding me? Did anyone else read that this week and go, I like the New Testament a little bit better? It's challenging. Only a fool will say that there is no God. The challenge with us thinking that this is just an Old Testament idea is that we also see it in the New Testament. Romans chapter 1, verses 18 through 20. It says, but God shows his anger from heaven against all sinful, wicked people who suppress the truth by their wickedness. They know the truth about God because he has made it obvious to them. For ever since the world was created, people have seen the earth and sky. Through everything God made, they can clearly see his invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature. So they have no excuse for not knowing God. Now, let me tell you, hey, hey OK, let's let's take a deep breath, because I know some of the people who are new, who brought somebody new, you're like, I brought them to the wrong week at church. Why are we talking about this? This message is not a message for the, on the non-believing world. I believe God stirred this message in my heart this week because Yes, we know that the world is falling apart. Yes, we know that the world is going to act like the world. It shouldn't surprise us when we turn on the Grammys this year and we see a satanic, demonic performance happen right before our eyes. Do we want it to happen? No, absolutely not. But we're also not going to be moved by it. We're not going to be moved by rumors of wars. We're not going to be moved by wars happening around the world. We're not going to be moved by pestilence by earthquakes, by famines, because Jesus told us that this is what's going to happen before he returns. The world, the world can be up in arms. The world can be in chaos, but not the body of Christ. No, God, Jesus himself told us, be prepared. In these last days, all of these things are gonna happen. The enemy is going to overplay his hand. You're going to see what's really happening. It's going to make you more confident in the spiritual battle that we're in right now. It's going to make you more confident that I'm coming back soon. And it should send, it should send you on mission with an urgency that you never had before to advance the kingdom of God and to preach the good news to those that don't have it. Because we're reading this text, and I'll tell you what, what's so amazing about this text is it's so easy for us to read Psalm 53 and, and point the fingers at all of the people we know in our lives, all of the people that we see on TV, all of the people we see on social media, hello, someone got convicted, all of the people that don't know God and blame them for not knowing God. But guess what? You and I were in the same place before Jesus saved you and me. Yes, this, this is going to happen to people. There will, there will be people that spend eternity in hell because they haven't been forgiven of their sins like you and I have. 
And Jesus didn't come to condemn the world. He came to save the world. He is sending people like you and me on mission to go find these people, to go love them. But here's the problem. And this is where I think the Lord, as, as I'm praying through this message, and I'm, he's giving me this, this very bombastic and provocative title. This message today is not for a non-believing world, but for a non-believing church. I want to share you guys a story. Uh, what's today? Sunday? Yesterday. Yesterday. Yesterday was my uh, seventh anniversary with my wife, Joy. Yeah, we did it. Seven, the number of completion, but we're not done yet. We're going we're gonna to keep trucking. We're going we're gonna to go the distance. But what's also cool about our, uh, my, our anniversary is it's also the day. It's my spiritual birthday. Yesterday, it marks 10 years of me walking with King Jesus. And if you've never heard of a spiritual birthday, I'll kind of allude to it at the end. But basically 10 years ago, I was super far from God, so lost, atheist, a fraternity kid at the University of Miami, smoked, three to, uh, smoked weed three to five times a day, got drunk every weekend, woke up next to girls I didn't even remember their names. That was my life. Mocked Christians, hated Christianity, and then I had a friend. I had one friend. The only friend that I had who was a Christian loved me right where I was at, shared the good news with me that Jesus wanted to give me a completely new life. Everything that I was chasing for in the things of this world could be found in the person of Jesus Christ, could be found by the power of the Holy Spirit. Introduces me to this good news. And I have an encounter with God, not religion, not a church, not even a book. And all of those things are good. But that's not what saved me. What saved me was an encounter with Jesus himself in my car. And I had this encounter with Jesus 10 years ago in my car on the way to the gym, 7 o'clock in the morning. It was a Monday. At a, at a, a red light, Holy Spirit just goes, <laughs> grabs my heart and says, give it up. Give it up. Stop being the director of your own life. Get out of the director's chair. You weren't made for you. I have a better script for you. And like a baby, I broke, I, I wept, I confessed my sin. I was like, I don't even know who you are, God. But I'm in. I'm in. I want this. My life was changed. And what was so funny was my life was changed, and I didn't really know the Bible. I didn't have perfect theology. I was still struggling with sin. I was still like struggling, like, okay, I've been forgiven. I've been changed. I'm a new person. I've been born again. But like, there's still things in my life, like this, I'm not doing this thing perfectly. But what's amazing was, it, it reminds me of the book of Acts, when Peter is preaching after Pentecost, and all of these like religious Pharisees are looking at him and, and the disciples, and they're like, they're marveling. Because they're like, these guys are untrained and unlearned men, but it's clear that they've been with Jesus. And that's what God did in my heart. I was like, I didn't know what I didn't know. All I knew was, I'm going to start reading this thing. I'm going to read the Gospels. I'm going to try to understand who Jesus is. I'm going to look at his life, and I'm going to go try and follow it. And I, I, I might be messy. It probably was super messy. I probably preached a lot of things that I would regret preaching today. But the point was, was that I was on fire. I knew that I was saved, and I knew that I was sent on mission. It was two weeks later, two, two to four weeks later, that I went on a surf trip with my friends to Nicaragua. The guy who actually led me to the Lord was there. He, he, he was on this trip with me and a couple other guys. And we're sitting on the beach and we are, uh, we're just, we're chilling. We're just like sitting down by the water. And then there's this group of, um, of homeless men who are local Nicaraguans. <laughs> I have to kind of give you the picture so you can visualize this. One of them was wearing tidy whities and socks on the beach. Like, I can't imagine anything more uncomfortable than wearing socks on the beach with tidy whities He's wearing all of this on the beach, and he's got uh, this handle of, like, cheap vodka. They're passing it back and forth to each other. They're just acting fools. They're just going crazy, um, just, just living their best life. And my friend, the one who led me to the Lord, walks up to this guy, uh, Captain Underpants, walks up to him. <laughs> I didn't even prepare that. That was from the Holy Spirit. Walks up to this guy. And he says, 
I just want you to know that Jesus loves you. So simple. And this guy, like, who was having the time of his life just partying like an animal, all of a sudden, like, just this cloud of darkness just came over his face. And he said, there is no God. Look at me. Easy for you to say, gringo. You're rich. You come here to vacation. You're going to leave soon. I'm from here. I'm homeless. God doesn't love me. There is no God. If there was a God and I jumped into that ocean right now, he wouldn't save me. And then my friend, I think totally led by the Holy Spirit, responds to him and says, I think you'd be surprised. The guy comes over to me. I'm doing like a little workout. I'm doing some push-ups on the beach. This guy, Captain Underpants, same guy, comes up to me. He starts, starts, starts doing like this Mr. Miyagi, like karate thing. And I'm like, brother, what are you doing here? Like, what, what's going on? I'm like, I'm not, I'm, I'm not like, I don't want the smoke. I'm not going to fight you, bro. And he's just like, and so I just kind of ignored him. And he said, all right, whatever, dude. He turns to the ocean and he dives into the ocean. But as he's diving in, the waves pull back and he dives head first into the ground breaks his neck and is lying face down in the water and now these waves are just crashing over him. And I watched this whole thing happen. It was literally right before my eyes. And it was like such a traumatic event where I was, I was like double taking like, did I just, did he just, did that just happen? And I kind of like call out to his friends. I'm like, hey, amigos, I think your friend just killed himself. And they were like, no, he's fine. He's just, he jokes around. He's just messing around. And I was like, okay. I turned back and this guy's just lifeless. Just floating in the water. Water's like, his face is down, not up, down. Waves are just crashing over him. And I was like, no, I know what I saw. I know what just happened. This dude, this dude just broke his neck. And I was like, no, no, we got to get him out. So then all of a sudden, like his friend's, like, fear of the Lord came upon them. They grab him. My friends grab him. He's being dragged out by an ankle and a wrist. His face just dragging across the sand as we pull him out of the water. All of these people from, like, we're, we're, we're screaming out to, like, this local restaurant on the beach. We're like, come help, 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 help. And, like, 50 people come out. This one Australian nurse comes out, starts trying to do CPR. And, like, he's lying there for, like, 10 minutes. He's not moving. There's nothing happening. And I, like me and my friend are just sitting there like we're just praying. We're just, we don't know what to do. Like I'm, I'm two weeks into this thing. Like I don't know what's going on. And I'm just praying. I'm just asking for God to, to do something, for God to move, for God to do a miracle. We're just praying, 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 praying. And then all of a sudden this guy just coughs up all this water. <gasps> and then he just starts crying out. And he's like, where's that guy? Where's that guy? Tears are flowing down his face. He's talking about my friend, the one who said that Jesus loves you. He kind of like, like the, the, the sea of the crowd kind of parted. He's like standing right there. He's like, come here. He grabs my friend's hand. He looks in my friend's eyes and he says, I saw the King of Kings. I saw the Lord of Lords. He's real. He's real. Everyone's like, what the heck? All sorts of different responses. Some people are praising God. Other people are mocking and thinking that wasn't God. It's amazing how the miraculous can polarize the room or the beach. Homie gets taken out in an ambulance. His friends who were with him were just partying. We end up going uh, to the side with them and we start praying with them. They start weeping. They start confessing their sins. They give their lives to Jesus in that moment. They're repenting. They get touched by God. And I'm thinking, dude, I am two weeks saved. And this is what is happening in my life. And I'm not saying this to say that I'm, that I'm cool or anything. Because I'm, I'm, what I'm trying to say is, what's amazing is, I didn't have perfect theology. I didn't have perfect doctrine. I didn't understand church tradition. I was just a guy who experienced the power of God and was desperately just trying to follow Jesus. 
and share him with other people. And God used that. God was able to use that. But if I could be completely honest, over the years when I start getting my theology right and, and, and all of a sudden am more interested in listening to sermons than I am on demonstrating the power of God to the people that God brings my way, I start creating this theological structure, this house that I can live in that makes me more comfortable not going out and doing the work of God. All of a sudden, it's a badge of honor to not believe God for the supernatural, to not believe God for the miraculous, to not be undignified and say, I'm willing to risk my reputation, to look foolish, to pray for the sick, to cast out demons, to preach the gospel. I'm putting my reputation on the altar, but if we're honest, over time, it becomes way more comfortable just to drink our coffee and to read our Bible and create all of this theology about why God might not actually want to do that these days. Why God doesn't really move like he used to move. And I believe what God is doing in our midst and what God is doing in this country we're seeing revival happen at university after university after university. What we're seeing God happen in, God do in this house, in this house at Love Church, over the past half, couple of months, like I've just been seeing an acceleration, a hunger. Is anybody else seeing it? Are you seeing the maturation of the body of Christ in this house? Which is so funny because in, in an upside down kingdom, maturation looks like becoming more childlike. And I'm seeing it happen and I'm moved and I know that God's heart is moved. But what the enemy would love to do, the enemy loves to make Christians pat themselves on the back and say, yo, go be a YouTube critic. Go post on social media and, and, and break down and condemn every move of God, every genuine move of God that's happening so you can feel better about your apathy. So you can be, feel better about not moving in the supernatural. So you can feel better about not believing God for the miraculous. I'm preaching to myself here too, guys. And I believe God is saying, wake up. Wake up, sleeper. Wake up. I'm coming back. And I'm calling you to advance my kingdom. I'm calling you to believe for this thing. But have you become an unbelieving believer? I want to read this scripture you, know, you want to know what we're called to? Here's what we're called to. You think, Cap, you're off your rocker. This isn't for us. What are you talking about? Well, do we like Jesus? Do we want to listen to what Jesus has to say? Let's listen to what Jesus says. Jesus says in Mark 16, verses 15 through 18, and then he told them, this is at the end, after his resurrection, he's commissioning. He's saying, you're the church. You're the answer to the world's problems. I'm commissioning you. I'm giving you my Holy Spirit. I'm giving you my authority. You go out and do the work. Don't ask me to do it. You go do it. I'm filling you. I'm, I'm empowering you. He says, go into all the world and preach the good news to everyone. Anyone who believes and is baptized will be saved. And anyone who refuses to believe will be condemned. These miraculous signs will accompany those who believe. They will cast out demons in my name. They will speak in new languages. Hello, come on, somebody. They will be able to handle snakes with safety. Don't try that at home. And if they drink anything poisonous, it won't hurt them. And I'm not saying go and drink bleach. We're not, we're not taking this scripture. Let me finish the last one. They will be able to place their hands on the sick and they will be healed. I'm not taking this scripture and I'm not saying let's twist this and let's twist God's arm and let's be mystical for the sake of being like mystical sake. What we're doing is we're saying, God, I'm going to humble myself before your word here. I'm not going to add an asterisk where you didn't add an asterisk. I'm not going to add parentheses where you didn't add parentheses. You said you want us to do this, and if we're, we're going to do it. And I'm not going to let the disappointment of it not happening, somebody not getting healed, somebody not getting delivered, somebody not coming to faith. I'm not going to let my disappointment create a false theology to make myself comfortable in unbelief. I believe the, I believe the Lord is calling the church to repent from unbelief, unbelief in the supernatural. We serve a supernatural Jesus. We don't serve a mythical Jesus. We don't serve a theoretical Jesus. We don't serve a philosophical Jesus. We serve a supernatural Jesus. 
And if you believe in Jesus, he's given you the Holy Spirit. He's given you his name. He's saying, I want to do greater works in you and through you than I did. Will you have the humility to say yes and amen? Man, I'm preaching. Sorry, guys. <laughs> hey. Question I want to ask is what happens when the church of Jesus Christ stop believes, stops believing in the almighty God? I'm not saying we stop going to church. I'm not saying we stop reading our Bibles. So important. So important. Do not misquote me and do not twist what I'm saying. I'm not saying we neglect these things. I'm saying that these things need to be a foundation and we need to go out into the deep with God and believe him for greater things. We have a culture right now that doesn't want another religion. They don't want another, they don't want, they don't want philosophy. They, they don't want lip service. We have a culture that's hungry for a supernatural God that can do the miraculous. That's why they're chasing after drugs. That's why I chased after drugs. I wanted an experience with the divine. I was chasing after something that I wasn't, like I was made for something more than this world. You and I all were. Eternity is written in our hearts and the world is on a quest for God. And they're looking in all the wrong places. And will you and I be the people that, sit, that show and demonstrate the power of God to a world that's crying out for it? Here's the first point I want you guys to write down about the supernatural. We got three points here. The supernatural, oh, this is gonna challenge some of us. Yay, God. The supernatural is the will of God. It is the will of God. Can the enemy do the supernatural? Yes, but everything he does is a counterfeit of what's true. So if the enemy is trying to counterfeit the real thing, Let's not stop doing it all together because he's counterfeiting it. Let's go after the real thing even harder. Let's pursue it. This is what it says in 1 Corinthians 4.20. I said 4.20 and got someone's attention. Lean in. 1 Corinthians 4.20. For the kingdom of God is not just a lot of talk. It is living by God's power. A lot of Christians, and hey, I'm, and I'm, Lord, convict me can create platforms and job security out of talking, 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 but not actually solving the problem with the power. God isn't looking for us just to bring presentations of the gospel, but demonstrations. The kingdom of God, I'll read it again, is not mere talk. It's living by God's power. 2 Timothy 3, 5, Paul is rebuking, he's not rebuking, excuse me, he's exhorting Timothy and he's saying, in the last days, hello, we're there. In the last days, watch out because there's going to be teachers that will teach all these things, trying to tickle your itching ears. And he also says this, they will act religious, but they will reject the power that could make them godly. Stay away from people like that. Man, that's a challenge for us right there. I want, I want to follow a Jesus that's doing what he did in the days of old. 1 Corinthians 14, 39 says, So my dear brothers and sisters, be eager to prophesy and don't forbid speaking in tongues. Paul's exhorting the church of Corinth. We read this just recently in our secondary readings. What's the heart of what he's saying? Hey, when you pursue these things, he, he, we, <laughs> things not said in the Bible. We said, don't, we said don't pursue the gifts, just pursue the fruits. That's not what Paul said. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 13, pursue the gifts. Pursue the love of God above everything, but pursue the gifts and just be ready because once we go after the mysteries of God, of course it's going to be messy. But God has made provision for the mess. And if there's no mess, the Bible says that where there is no oxen, there is no mess. But where there are oxen, there's a lot of produce. What that means is sometimes you got to embrace the mess in order to grow and to advance. And God has made provision for the mess. Don't despise the supernatural. Don't despise the things of God. Embrace it. This is the second point. The supernatural will humble those who are being saved. I want to look to no further than Jesus himself. Matthew chapter 12, verses 22 through 32. It says, then a demon-possessed man who was blind and couldn't speak was brought to Jesus. 
He healed the man so that he could both speak and see. Isn't that amazing? Isn't it amazing that this guy came in, had physical issues going on, blind, couldn't speak. And Jesus knew that the root of this issue wasn't just a physiological issue, it was a spiritual issue. There was demonization in this guy's life that was kept keeping him bound. It was a spirit of infirmity. And Jesus looks at this guy and says, he doesn't say, I can't do anything about that. God might not want to heal you. Sorry. We're going to the next person. Jesus is willing. Jesus casts out the demon. And look at what happens. The crowd was amazed and asked, could it be that Jesus is the son of David, the Messiah? When we move forward in faith, the Bible says that without faith, it's impossible to please God. But God is a rewarder of those who believe that he is, and he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. God is looking for a measure of faith. You know what moves God? You know what God marvels at? Faith. Us saying, I don't fully understand, but I'm going to hear this word. I'm going to be a doer of the word because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. But faith without works is dead. So faith looks, me, looks like me taking this word, not fully understanding it, but saying, God, regardless, I'm going to step out and see this thing happen. And if it doesn't happen the way that I thought it would happen, I'm not going to create a theology around why I should never do it again. I'm going to keep showing up. I'm going to keep growing in faith. I'm going to be transferred from glory to glory to glory by the spirit of the Lord. And I want to say this, because here's what's amazing, is you have these people who are marveling at what Jesus is doing. And I want, I, want to, I want to emphasize this. Deliverance is, has been such a tricky topic in the body of Christ. Casting out demons, setting people free. Pretty simple. Jesus wants to set the captives free. And there might be things in your life, even as a believer, you've repented a million times and you still struggle with certain thoughts. Domineering thoughts of suicide, domineering thoughts of lust, domineer, domineering thoughts of anger. And now you're stuck in shame and condemnation because you're like, I don't know what else to do. I'm doing all the right things. I'm repenting. I'm coming to church. I'm reading my Bible. I'm going to small group. And I don't even want to share what's going on in my mind because I don't want everyone else around me to judge me and just give me another prescription. Like, try harder. Work harder. Could it be that there's things going on in your life that you, like, you, you can't discipline your way out of? And I'm not saying don't do the disciplines, but what I'm saying, when you've exhausted every other option, Jesus wants to deliver you. And I hope that hits somebody in this house. You've been bound for years and you've been ashamed of the thoughts and the torment. And I'm telling you that on behalf of our leadership team, we want to see you set free because Jesus paid a high price for you to be set free. So here's what I'm going to invite you to do. You can take this in your notes. I'm not going to expose you. I don't want to make this weird for you. But I want you to write down info at lovechurch.org. Email us this week. If that's you and you're like, I can't, I hear these voices. I have this constant haunting feeling around me wherever I go. I love God. I'm filled with this Holy Spirit. I don't know what's going on. You might need to be delivered and Jesus wants to deliver you. And it's not freaky. It's what you were created for. You were created to be set free from the spiritual enemy that wants to drag you down. The invitation is for you. Write that down. Email us this week. We want to see you set free. We're coming to the end of our time here. I'm just believing that God's going to touch someone with that. We had someone at the previous encounter hear that online and reach out to us immediately. There's no shame. The enemy would love to keep you in shame. If he can keep you in shame, he can, he can stay hidden. The enemy loves to be camouflaged. Because as soon as he's exposed, we can kick him out. We're putting him on notice today. Final point, point number three. The supernatural will harden the religious heart. This is why I believe God is using Psalm 53 to speak this to our body right now. Yes, we want to preach to a dying world that doesn't believe in Jesus. But I believe God is challenging us right now and saying, what do you believe? 
That scripture in Matthew chapter 12 goes on to say, but when the Pharisees heard about the miracle, they said, no wonder he can cast out demons. He gets his power from Satan. Oh my gosh, can you imagine accusing Jesus of following Satan? The prince of demons. Jesus knew their thoughts. I love Jesus. He knew their thoughts and replied, any kingdom divided by civil war is doomed. A town or family splintered by feuding will fall apart. And if Satan is casting out Satan, he is divided and fighting against himself. His own kingdom will not survive. And if I am empowered by Satan, what about your own exorcists? They cast out demons, so they will condemn you for what you have said. But if I'm casting out demons by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God has arrived among you. For who is powerful enough, come on, man, who is powerful enough to enter the house of a strong man and plunder his goods? Only someone even stronger. Someone who could tie him up and then plunder his house. Anyone who isn't with me opposes me. Hear that. Anyone who isn't with me opposes me. And anyone who isn't working with me is actually working against me. So I tell you, every sin and blasphemy can be forgiven except blasphemy of the Holy Spirit, which will never be forgiven. Anyone who speaks against the Son of Man can be forgiven, but anyone who speaks against the Holy Spirit will never be forgiven either in this world or in the world to come. I don't think we treat that scripture with enough reverence because we look at that scripture and we, try to, we, we, we make up a lot of things of what it could mean, but as I read the context of what's happening here, I don't think it could be more clear. Jesus is going out and he's doing the supernatural. He's advancing the kingdom of God in the name of his Father and he's being, he's being rebuked by the religious people for it they're saying that you're doing this by the power of Satan. He's saying, you don't know what you're getting yourself into. Don't call the work of the Holy Spirit the work of the devil. Is anyone feeling that? Is anyone feeling the weight of that? Lord, I hope that it becomes an anvil on our hearts, that we are not quick to judge. We're not quick to mock. We're not quick to criticize legitimate moves of God. I want to share this final thing. And I recognize what I'm about to share because I believe God gave me a prophetic word for this, this body. And I want to invite you to test the spirit of this, to test the spirit behind this. The Bible says test all, test the spirit behind all prophecy, which is really just hearing a word from God and delivering it. And if, I, if, if this is off, I am willing to humble myself before this body and admit it and be accountable. You can't stone me. We're not doing that anymore. We're in the new covenant. But I'm sharing this because I really want to present this. I believe that this is from the heart of our father. This is what he wrote through my hand yesterday. I was spending time with him. He said, I am pouring out grace and favor over your church in this season. People will travel from distant lands to marvel at the miracle of my presence in this house. Greater glory will be released. In other words, he's saying, we're just getting started now. He's so excited for what he's going to do. But then he says this, are you ready for it? I'm not talking about your systems. I'm not talking about your parking lot. I'm not talking about your kids' rooms. I'm not talking about your serve teams, all good things. I'm talking about your hearts. My son said you would worship me in spirit and in truth. You have opened the door to my spirit, but will you keep it open? I will move in ways that will make you uncomfortable. I will even offend some of you, and you will fall away. Don't let it happen. I will forgive whomever I want. I will speak through whomever I want. I will heal. I will do miracles. I will blow your minds. Come on. Receive it. Don't despise the supernatural that will occur. 
Don't scoff at the deliverances as I free my captive children and send the demons screaming. This is my will. This is my kingdom. Repent. Return. It's here and it's coming. I love you, the Father. So as we close, I just want to give the body an opportunity. This is a good challenge for us, man. God is doing amazing things in our midst, and we want to be prepared for it. If there's anybody here who struggles with unbelief, and you're saying, God, I believe, but help me in my unbelief, I want to invite you just to stand up wherever you're sitting. Have the humility to stand up right now. Love it. Praise God. Praise God. I believe, but help me in my unbelief. See you in the back. God sees you. Come on. I just want you to put out your hands in a posture of receiving right now. I don't know what happened to you. I don't know what prayer didn't get answered. I don't know who didn't get healed. I don't know who didn't get delivered. I don't know who didn't come back to life. I don't know who didn't get saved. But I believe the Father is telling us hope again. Believe me again. Press in. Share this quick word, Luke 5. Peter's fishing all night long, doesn't catch anything. Jesus comes on the shore and says, go deeper and cast out your net again. Father, we ask right now for you to forgive us of our unbelief. We repent. Increase our faith in you. We're believing you for more. We're believing you for greater things. Forgive us for taking your word and twisting it to comfort us in our disappointment. You never disappoint. You never disappoint. We choose today to grow, to go from glory to glory, to have hope again, to have faith again, to allow you to move like we've never seen you move. In Jesus' name.